Well, good evening. <laughs> I have to say, oh, I don't even know if I could put words to express how much a joy it is to me to be here with you. Um, it's been a few years since I've actually been able to be at K2. I've slipped in several times over the last 20 years or so, but um, it is a joy to be in your presence tonight. Um, I love my brother and his wife and his children. And just so you know, yes, Dave has always been this wonderful. <laughs> he used to tick me off a little. I was five years older than him. And um, I just couldn't understand how a boy could be so sweet all the time. And I wasn't. But he has always been like this. And you have a wonderful pastor. Gift, gift from Jesus. And um, thanks for loving him and his family. And I just want to say good job for coming out on Friday night. What this means, and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 55. Um, what this means is that you're hungry. You're hungry for Jesus. Um, I think this is the fourth Friday night in a row that I have preached. Isn't that interesting that the church is coming together on Friday nights? That's how hungry we are, how much we know that we need the Lord. And he sees you. He's invited you here. K2 did not invite you. Jesus did. And you coming on a Friday evening to be together in the word and in his presence, you delight his heart. And he is going to be here tonight and share his very life with us. I'm looking forward to what he has to say to each of us. So is this up and going? There we go. All right. I'm going to read from Isaiah 55, starting at verse 1. This is just one of my favorite passages. Ho. And what is that word anyway? I believe it's the breath of God. I believe it's the powerful ruach. Ho. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your labor for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. He's called to you and here you are. And he is going to speak to us tonight. I don't know about your background, but my background, I did not come from a really deeply evangelical church background or or family. Um, I wasn't really exposed to that kind of experience until I was a young adult. But there were a lot of Christian vocabulary words that I heard, but I didn't know what they meant. Words like saved, I really didn't know what that meant. Um, faith, what is that anyway? Justified, um, born again, sanctification. I never heard that word till I was probably 20. And then grace, what is grace actually? And holiness. I didn't know what those words meant, but I wanted to know. They were used often, but I didn't understand the content. And then I went to a Christian college and I don't even think I was a Christian yet. But what happened at a Christian college was I saw all these young people my age and they were carrying around their Bibles. And they seemed to know what was in them and understand it. And 
what really shocked me was when people were preaching, they seemed to really understand what the preacher was talking about. And I just sort of had this gloss. I didn't get it. I didn't understand. But I was so struck by the devotion of these young people my age that I kind of hung my faith on them. And I thought, if they can love God like that, I'm going to watch them and I'm going to trust their faith. And that was how my journey to Jesus began. And Jesus was very cool with that. He was. I thought he wouldn't be, but he was. He was like, oh, I like that idea. Let's go with that. But then what happened was their love for Jesus created in me a curiosity. And it created a longing in my heart for him. And that longing, I don't know if any of you have that longing. You're like, what is this God thing about and this holiness thing? That is grace. Because what that is, is God himself speaking and pursuing our hearts. And so the longing and the desire and the hunger that we have to know him more is actually God himself speaking. And that desire is actually our first exposure to the beauty of holiness. Did you ever hear that phrase? The beauty of holiness? It's in the Bible quite a few times. But Jesus, when I was in my 20s, he was pursuing my heart. I was lonely and I was deep in sin and I felt unwanted. And all of a sudden, I began to sense that my creator, the lover of my soul, wanted me. We sang about that a minute ago. And he wanted me for his very own. And he wanted me to give myself to him exclusively. And it was it was like something I had never comprehended before because someone, there was someone to whom I really belong. And I want you to know this is true for every one of you in this room. Jesus wants you and you belong to him. You're made for him. To belong to God for me is a more powerful reality than the idea of being controlled by him. I think it's just more alluring. The holy people are people who belong to Jesus. He wants us. He's given himself for us. And to be a holy person is to be someone who belongs to God. And we don't want to think of a holy life merely as obedience. That's not the first thing. It's belonging. It's a mutual self-offering. He's offering himself to us. And we get to offer ourselves to him. And it's a continual relationship of mutual self-offering and mutual belonging. Remember how many times in the Bible does God say, you are my people and I am your God. That's marriage language. It's I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. And that's the essence of holiness. Is that kind of belonging. Holiness is beautiful and, ho and beauty is not passive. It is not passive. Beauty is not the object of our desire. Like Jesus, the object of our desire. That's not what first happens. Beauty is personal. Just like goodness is personal, truth is personal because our creator is triune. He's three persons. And what happens with beauty is that we are the object of God's desire. So beauty 
pursues us. Okay, I've just been here a few hours. I've been here a few times in years past, but every time we drive down the road and I look out the window and those mountains, those are not passive. Those are after me. It's a powerful beauty that grasps hold of me. And, I, and they just reach out and grab me like a gorgeous sunset. That's the image of God in creation. That's the beauty of holiness. And that's the holy love of God. That's how he reaches into our lives. He ravishes our hearts, just like love. And what we do is we go, oh, like I do every time I see those mountains. We respond to beauty. We respond to his holy love. And that's called awe. In the Bible, you see that as you're reading your Bibles, you see that that's the fear of the Lord. It's oh, bigger than me, greater. Because God, I think his first name is Wonder, with a capital W. And he is here tonight. He's here this weekend. And he's come for us. And he wants us for his very own. Our posture of our beings is that we are offering ourselves to him this weekend. And so I am just going to give you um, one of my favorite personal definitions of holiness. Somebody asked me this a couple years ago. What is your one sentence definition of holiness? And for me, it's, um, it's this. It's the physical embodiment of the presence of God. I'm going to read a couple passages from um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you want to look there. It says, God who said light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shone in our hearts. Remember when God said, let there be light? And there was light. There was no sun. There was no moon. That light was God himself. And it says that light has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And we have this same treasure in earthen vessels made of dust and clay so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, always carrying about in our body the dying of Jesus. You've been talking about a life worth dying for. The dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. God intends to live inside you. His very life, the spirit of God, you're his temple. And he is intending to come and inhabit your being, transform every bit of who you are so that as you go to work where you go to work, or go to school, you're taking the living God of holy love in your being. And he will shine through your eyes and through your smile. And the words that will come out of you will be of him. He intends to put his nature in us, to transform us so that we can be his light in the world. And that's what holiness is. And that's what we're going to talk about this weekend. So holiness is his personal presence of God himself transforming and recreating any person, any situation, any person, yes, even you who think it can't be, and any situation. And we say yes, yes. And that's the only satisfaction there is in life, in my opinion. So what comes into our minds when we think about God, that's the most important thing about us. 
And what God wants to do is create an accurate view of who he is. And if something isn't beautiful, it cannot be true. And if someone is telling us that for all of our life, we're just going to have that sin, that thing that is creaming us, that's wrecking our relationships, but hey, nothing we can do about it. And Jesus is a little too weak. Sorry, he can't handle your sin. You're going to have to muddle along until you die. But Jesus has a blanket he covers you with. He can't really see you, but he can only see this blanket of covering but you're gonna to have to muddle along. That's not beautiful. That's hard. That's despairing to me. I think it's Gnostic to think that the God who created everything that is cannot handle the sin in our life. He can't handle our addictions. He can't handle my ridiculous temper. Yes, he can. He can. He can make us whole and complete. He can make us people of love. He can make us holy. He's commanded us to be holy. I don't think he would command us to do something that he cannot provide for us to be. He is calling us into a face-to-face, -face, unveiled intimacy with himself in order to transform our natures. He's done that for me. I believe he can do that for every person. And he can satisfy our longings, all of our longings, with his own heart and his own life. I think he can even do that tonight. The gift of hunger. This verse is what this was the beauty that ravished my heart when I was about 20 years old, reading my Bible for the first time, this verse. And I am so grateful that God has given me a hunger for his word. Even on the worst days when my life is falling apart, I live for that moment in the morning when I wake up. It's the highlight of my life when I open his word because I know this word does not come from this world. The Bible comes from outside this world, outside the chaos and the brokenness of my life is truth and it's his voice. And he meets me face to face and speaks from outside this world into my chaotic mess with what is true and good. And I know he will meet me in the word and I know he will meet you as well. Abraham Heschel says that seeking God is addressing ourselves. It's like turning our being to him with the aim of getting close to him. It involves a desire for experience and encounter rather than information. And so we come to his word. We're not just trying to learn stuff about him. We actually get to encounter him. And what's more than just obeying his commandments or seeking his help, it means that we're actually seeking Jesus. That's what the hunger is. And I have found the Bible to be better than chocolate. Seriously, I kid you not. I am not making that up. The Bible reveals to us the very nature of God and our nature. It's just as much about who we are as it is about him and about the nature of all the universe. And so the Bible is our source and it's the foundation for all of our thinking, our hopes. It reveals to us what is real and substantive of value and unchanging. How's that compared to the news every night? Yeah, wow. So if you don't have that sense about the word, if it just is like hard, just ask Jesus to say, I want to hunger for your word. Ask him to create a hunger. 
he hears, the, he hears your cries and he can give that to you. But let me tell you, that's what your Life Together groups are about. Those groups are places where we come together and we encourage one another to posture our beings to be able to hear from Jesus. So those are very, very important. And they help us to learn how to trust him and to turn our lives to him so that he can transform us and put his life and his image back into us again. And that's what holiness is. It's his beautiful character embodied in our daily lives. And so those life together groups are really important for helping with that. To know is to experience. This is our granddaughter. She's learning to feed herself. And man, eating, she was all about it. And she still is. This is what Jesus wants us to love reading the Bible like this. He does. Like, feel it. That's why I tell people, this, get a Bible with pages you can smell and touch and draw in. It, it, it affects us, our psychology and our brain differently than, than things on a screen. But babies, what do they do when, they, when they're crawling around and they find something, they don't know what it is? How do they figure out what it is? What do they do with it? They put it in their mouth. That's a theological reality. It really is. Because tasting is knowing. To taste is to know. You know that word, um, I know your pastors talked about this, the idea of to know in the Bible. In the Hebrew, it's yada, and in the Greek, it's gnosko. It's not intellectual understanding, it's experiencing. It means to apprehend into one's being. And it's used most of the time about the way God knows us. God wants to apprehend you into his being. And we can know him with that same kind of experiential knowledge. One time I had, I'm always leading discipleship groups with women and we try to keep each other accountable on our quiet time. How's your time in the word? You know, we're, trying, we're, we're going for a daily quiet time. And this one lady should never have a quiet time, ever. She's really struggled with it. And she said, I had to study and I don't know, I don't understand how you can enjoy reading your Bible like you do. She said, I can't. I am just not a reader. I just can't get into it. And I said, oh, I, I don't read my Bible. And I didn't even think about my answer. It was not premeditated at all. It was just, no, 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 I don't read my Bible. I said, it's much more like eating. And it is, it's just, it's because it's a real encounter with the Lord. And, you know, in the, in the Hebrew mind and in the, written word of God. It's so fascinating that the expression that is often referred to as the deepest kind of knowing in the Bible is tasting. And most of the time when it's talking about tasting of the Lord, it's referred to as sweet. Isn't that cool? Taste and see that the Lord is good. So I love this passage. This is my experience. You who know, O oh Lord, remember me. Notice me. See me. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I've been called by your name. He's called me for his very own. And I am yours, O oh Lord of hosts. So tasting is knowing. This is the same granddaughter. And she didn't live near me. So I was seeing her after not having seen her for a couple months. And she's like leaning back, looking. And then she just dove in for a kiss. Kissing is theological. I'm not going to go there, but I just want you to know it is. So in the Bible, to taste is to engage ontologically with. It's to know experientially and receive into the depths of our innermost being. Very important because that's the place that forms our beliefs, our deepest loves, and our deepest hatreds. So this is very critical 
if you think about it in our culture, it means to grasp into oneself. What we taste of, we are creating communion. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. When we taste, he's offering his, his body and his blood. It creates union with what we taste of. So my question to you is, what are you tasting of? What are you feasting upon? Very important to ask Jesus to help us understand that because what we're tasting of, we're trying to satisfy a longing, a desire. There's a passage in Proverbs that says, gossip is like a dainty morsel. It goes down into the innermost parts. So if we are listening to gossip, it's forming us. It's changing our opinion of somebody. If we have a constant diet of Twitter or the news, ESPN, I'll tell you, resentment, it's a weird taste, but we sort of love it. I just, self-righteous, I have a right carry that resentment, it goes into the innermost part of our being and it forms who we are and how we live. I'll tell you, my favorite thing tastes the best of anything I've ever tasted besides the word of God, self-pity. It's like chocolate mousse to me. And Jesus came to me several years ago and it was a scorching breath of the Holy Spirit. And he said, that is sin, your self-pity you wallow in. And I had to give that up. And it talk about freedom. So the Bible, the word of God, the Lord Jesus himself is the only thing we are intended to taste of in that kind of delicious kind of way because it's forming us. We are created for communion with the very voice of God. Every one of us in this room are created for communion with the voice of the living God, the very voice that created the entire universe. You are created for him. And we can discipline and train ourselves to feast upon him. I just love this passage. In the morning, good time for feasting. Break that fast. Not your, not your social media, not your phone. The word of God, satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love. Very, very helpful. So seeking, seeking implies that something's not there. If I'm seeking something, it means that I don't have it yet. Right? Sort of logical. And I have always thought that if something wasn't there in me, then that means I'm incomplete. And if I'm incomplete, I must be broken a little bit, and there must be that something's wrong, and that's kind of a weakness, and if I'm a little bit weak, that can't be good, and if it's not good, must be a result of sin, right? That sinful thing that happened in chapter 3 of Genesis when Adam and Eve wrecked the world. So my weakness, my incompleteness is a result of sin. But before the fall, the first two chapters of Genesis, it says God patterned, God created humans in his own image. He patterned them after himself. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and told them, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Be masters over the fish and the birds and the animals. And God said, look, I've given you the seed-bearing plants throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And he goes on and all that he's provided for the animals. And God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was excellent in every way. That's the translation. Very good. And this happened on the sixth day. Do you know the, the story of who we are 
as human persons does not begin in chapter 3 of Genesis with the fall. It begins in the creation. We are made perfectly by God. Everything he made was perfect, exactly as he intended. The gospel does not begin with all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not the gospel. That's the interruption. That's the broken part. The gospel, the good news, is the way God created us. How he created us in his image. That's where the gospel starts. And that understanding is key to understanding what holiness means. I love this word, tov, that means exactly as I intended. Because it means appropriate, right, perfect. All that makes happy gives pleasure. It means beauty. And God like a master craftsman, like an artist, he makes everything. He steps back and he goes, oh, yes, it came out exactly as I intended. That's who we are. That's what God thinks of human nature. That's our created reality. That's the beginning of our story. And then I got to thinking about it in that passage I just read, it says that he gave them food. And I thought, wait a minute, food means they're hungry. And so there, there was a need. There was a need for nourishment. So I, I just started thinking about this more. I thought, before sin ever entered the world, our human nature was designed with all kinds of neediness for food, for air, for water, for relationship. So to need is part of the essence of God's very good and perfect in every way. To be incomplete, to not be self-sufficient or self-sustaining, live in a state of humility, basically, it's humbling to say, I gotta eat, I gotta breathe. What this is saying, we are designed for someone outside of ourselves. We are finite, we require sleep. We have to have rest. We are the creatures, we're not the creator. We're not self-sufficient, we're contingent, we're dependent, we're interdependent, and we're hungry. All of this before the fall. This is what God says is a perfect human being. That's really good news. The fact that I can't handle my life on my own, that's our state that God declares perfect because we are created for him. We're made for him to fill our life. All of these longings of our created good, all of these things, we're created in his image. That means God has desires. God has longings. What does he desire? Us. He desires us. So to be blameless, the, the biblical word that's in your Bible, blameless quite often, it means complete. It means whole. It doesn't mean never make a mistake. It means to be filled with God. I love what John Wesley says. He says, what is the most perfect creature in heaven and earth in your presence, God, but avoid someone who's empty, Capable, that's the key. Human beings are created capable of being filled with God by God. That's our perfect goodness. That's a perfect human being. It's someone who is made for God. That space, that hole that we're created with. 
And so this word satisfies all over the Bible. And it means to have enough, to fill to the full continually, to have an abundance, to be sated. I love that word. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and the wonders he does for his children. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry soul with what is good, with himself. I I believe with all my heart that satisfaction is one of the major themes of the entire Bible. Being satisfied in Jesus Being filled with his life is the key to blamelessness. It's the key to being holy. Because being holy means we are incomplete without him, but with him we are complete. That's the natural state of our being. And we can only be holy and totally satisfied when we come face to face with God. Not marching off, doing all kinds of good work for him, but intimate, face-to-face relationship with him. When we turn away from this, in, this obsession with ourself, me, me, my, I, everywhere I go, it's about me. We turn away from that. It's called repentance, turning away from self to God, because this self thing is a mud hole. Of deception, isn't it? And grief, and we turn toward God. He's our source, he's our light, he's our life. When we do that, we taste. We taste of the goodness of God because he's our source. And it's like, it's like we've been eating dog food our whole life. And then we turn to this magnificent feast. And when we begin to taste of the living God, He transforms our appetite. Addiction. He transforms our appetite by the health and the life food with a capital F. He is our food. He's Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So what we need to do is become food snobs. We need to reject feed and learn to feed on him. And when we do, we receive his very life and he transforms our beings, our actual bodies, the way our, our brain, our neuro pathways change, our desires, our appetites are transformed, and sin then begins to be tasteless. Things we used to love, we don't love anymore. Things that used to be funny, we don't think they're funny anymore. He changes our appetite. It's amazing and beautiful. Then we can walk with God. Then we we can experience the joy of what the Bible calls a blameless life. Then we are complete and whole. And our desires and our passions are redirected. So often, we try to beat our sin. Okay, today, Jesus, today, God, I'm going to do it today. I'm not going to sin today. That thing that I always fall into, it's not going to happen today. I'm going to do better, God. Never happen. And he never asks us to do it like that. He wants us to feed upon his life and his life in us gives us a new life. It's his life in our life. And then we can walk with God. Then we can live in obedience. So often we start with the obedience, but we don't have his life. Jesus says, abide in me. And then you will love me, and then you will obey my commands. He wants to fill us with himself. So God invented eating. It's so awesome. It's a symbol of him. And eating is good and satisfying and delicious because it's a symbol of him. He is good. He is satisfying. His life is delicious. In myself alone, there is no good. That's why we love to eat. It's all a symbol that points to his nature. I am convinced that the most 
accurate, the most true way to describe human nature is hungry, not sin. Hungry. Every human person is hungry for God. Every single human person. Putin is hungry for God. He has a ravenous, distorted, corrupted, evil appetite. But his baseline truth about him is he is made for God. And he's devouring the world out of his perverted, corrupted hunger. And that's what sin does. But the truest thing about us, the truest true about everyone, even that person who's wrecking your life right now, in Jesus' eyes, the truest thing about them is they need him. And what they're really longing for is God himself. As fallen creatures, every single one of us are born into sin. And all of us are sinful at birth. But we still bear his image And our distorted hunger is now what we have to contend with. Our appetites that are perverted. And the Bible calls that flesh. In your Bibles as you're reading along, it's sometimes called flesh. It doesn't mean our bodies. It means trying to live life without the presence of God. It might be translated sinful nature. But that's not God's intention for us. That is not what he wants. Original sin does not cancel out God's intended design, which is that we long for him and we're hungry for him and everyone's created to be filled with his life. And that's what satisfaction is. He created us this way. He we took the dust Into his hands, he lifted it to his face, and he breathed his own life into the dust in Genesis chapter 2. But what we do in our lives, what we do is we say, this is what Adam and Eve did. We listen to that whisper of doubt, and we say, hmm, created perfectly Adam and Eve were created perfectly in perfect intimacy and union with God. But they didn't trust him. They didn't trust his ways. And they turned from God. They doubt the goodness of his character and turned their face away from God. And so his image was lost. And what happens in each of our lives is God has created us for an intimate face-to-face relationship. He wants to breathe his spirit into our beings with his faith. We're looking at him. He's created us. We belong to him. He's breathing his life. And when his life fills our beings, that is what creates a living human person. But we're like, oh, God, I don't really care. I don't think you know what you're talking about. I don't trust I don't think you have my best interest. Your ways are really weird. And if I follow your ways, I am probably going to get canceled. And we turn. We turn our face from him. And we start living our own way. And he's trying to breathe his life into our being. And we're just marching our own way. We're saying, you know, God, I really like this thing about you saving me. And I don't want to go to hell when I die. But would you just get your hands off my life? And he's trying to breathe life in, and, we're, and he's got the side of our head. It kind of reminds me of my kids when they were teenagers. And they're just, <laughs> turn like that, and that's what we do to God. But then we march, we just, in full-out rebellion, give him the back of our head. And we're marching off, doing our own thing. And that is called death. And we can, we sang about it, we can be breathing but we're dead. And Paul writes about that. He said, you are dead in your trespasses. And those of us who have turned our face away from God, doing our own thing, are living dead people. And he is calling us back. I do this with my kids and my grandkids. I'm like, hey, baby, come, come here, come here. Come here, look at me, look at me. Pitching 
fits, tantrums, and you hold their face in your hands. Say, look at me, look at me. Honey, I love you. What's wrong? And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to bring us back to him so he can pour his very life into our beings. So separation from our source is sin. Separation, this turning away and doing our own thing and not trusting him. And sin begins with distrust in his character. And disbelief is a result of distrust. Disobedience is down the line. Disobedience is a manifestation, but it's this trust thing. And what we're doing is we're, the essence of sin is when we second guess God. We say, you know, I don't think you're really my friend. Honestly, I don't even think you're good. And we vaunt ourselves in our own estimation above the one who is truth himself. And the deceiver whispers this stuff in our minds and he creates distortion and doubt. It leads to depression and despair and a gasping of our spirits because we have turned from his breath. And sin is applied to our record, not just when we hear stuff because you can't avoid it, but when we take these messages You can't trust God. He doesn't know anything about sexuality. His limits are too hard. We don't like his limits. We don't like his boundaries. And we think we know a better way. And then we taste of these doubts and these distortions. It's a misplaced appetite. And when we taste of deception... Truth, who is a beautiful person, becomes distorted. And we ooze into a self-made luxury of doubting the Holy One, who is pure love. And that will affect your life. It will kill your marriage. It will affect your church, your community, your state. But when we turn back to him, We have life again. And ask the Spirit if he will reveal to you what the whispers of doubt about who he is, where you have been distrusting his goodness. Just ask him if he would reveal to you areas where you have believed those whispering lies. This is Smeagol. Do you know him from Lord of the Rings? This is what happens When we turn from God and we say, hmm, I like this other thing. This sounds really good to me. I kind of like my own way. And we turn and focus in on my precious. And that's called self. And we become our own God. And and the definition of sin is a self curved in on self. And what happens is our nature becomes corrupted. And the image of God that makes us fully human is destroyed. Jesus said, whoever finds their life will lose it. The Greek actually says, destroy it. You focus in on yourself, you become monstrous. And We lose the goodness of God. We lose truth. We lose an other orientation. All of those things come from God himself. That's what we mean when we say a person is lost. They've lost the image of God. And we become a golem. A golem is a mythical creature who was made of clay and had no spirit. And that's why Tolkien used that word. Say Gollum. Just say it. Gollum. Do you feel the choking? Gollum. 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 Remember how Gollum used to choke? It's a picture of what it's like for us to try to live without complete dependence on God and being filled with his spirit. It's decay and corruption. And the Bible refers to this as sin. 
It's the sinful nature. And it's hell in us, and it's hell is us. And in Isaiah 53, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to their own way. And the Hebrew actually says, each one has turned our face away from God. Face away to self is the Hebrew. And it creates a monstrous person. It starts with a misplaced meal. And it causes us to devour one another in our families, in our communities. Talk about 2020 politics. That was devouring of people upon people. And Jesus has come to set us free from that. Our entire beings are designed with need. We are created with need. Our physical realities proclaim that we are not self-existing, We are not self-reliant. We are dependent on someone outside of ourselves. What this means is that we are created to be desperate for God. And when we come to the realization that we can't do our life, Jesus, I need you every hour. He says, thank you very much. Thank you for noticing. That's the beginning of holiness, to know you are desperate for God. That is holiness because you are living in truth. You're living in the reality of who you are. We are desperate for him. And all of our appetites are just symbols that point to him. We are made for another. We are made for our creator, who is the source of our life, and we are made for each other. And the the nature of sin is relational. It's about our intimate face-to-face relationship with God. And when we're living in that rebellion, we're just saying, I'm just satisfied with you, God. You don't satisfy me. You're not good enough. I don't like your resume. I don't accept you. I mean, my son, when his freshman year of college, he got a fungus in his blood that went systemic and he got double pneumonia and he wouldn't answer my phone calls and he wouldn't go to the clinic. Mom, I got this. I got this. Just about died. To say I got this is no satisfaction. You don't. But Jesus can satisfy every longing and we have all these distracted appetites All these things, and none of these are bad, are they? I'll tell you, sometimes I have this clawing empty in me, and it claws for being noticed, acknowledged, and it is ugly as can be. And I have to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, what is wrong with me? Fill me all these crazy things that we think are going to satisfy us. None of them do, ultimately, because we're made for him. Self-gratification is the imposter of true satisfaction. But we just keep going and going. Anytime we're trying to find satisfaction outside of Jesus, it's idolatry. That's the definition of idolatry. It's false And it will destroy our lives. It just leads to destruction. So everything we eat becomes us. Everything we just had for supper, it's becoming who we are. So it's very important to think about what we're feeding on. I love, because we are what we eat. You are what you eat. And Paul says, taste the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled up You may attain to the fullness of being. That means Genesis 1 and 2. Everything God created you to be. And what is that? The fullness of God himself. He intends to put his life inside of you. That's what Paul's talking about in all these passages. And you can call that, some people call it the true self. It's who you truly are. You will be your true self when your creator fills your being. 
we will feed ourselves because we have this emptiness. We need to feel full. So are we feeding on social media or shopping or Pinterest or sports or gambling? What are you feeding on? This guy's eating a pot of dirt. And he doesn't even know it. That's the thing. I've done that before. I love this passage in Isaiah. The poor deluded fool feeds on ashes. The definition of fool in Hebrew is empty. Empty. Empty of God. He's trusting something that can't give him any help at all. Yet he can't bring himself to ask, is this thing, this iPhone or idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? Nope, I'm not going to ask that. I'm just going to go on and be dumb and become addicted to my screens. Pay attention, O oh people. You are mine. I, the Lord, made you. And I will not forget to help you. I've swept away your sins like the morning mist. I've scattered your offenses like the clouds. Return to me. Turn your face back to me. For I have paid the price to set you free. Jesus said, blessed are the hunger, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. And he is the one who satisfied. He satisfies our lives. When we come face to face with beauty, I'll tell you one thing he does. It's so cool. He takes the mundane things of life, the things that we used to think were so dumb and boring and not quite big enough or great, and he makes them full of delight. I had four little kids, and all I did was walk around with my little spanking spoon and try to get them to obey and wipe their noses and change their diapers. And I would wake up every morning and say, Jesus, I love my life. How does that happen? My son teaches middle schoolers. He loves them with a passion. Jesus, when the Spirit of God comes, he takes the mundane and transforms it into eternal sacred realities. That's the beauty of holiness. Happy are those whom you call and you draw to your courts to dwell there. That's you on a Friday night. You will be satisfied by the beauty of the presence of God, by his holiness. Beautiful promise. Tasting is knowing. So what pastures are you dwelling in? What are you feeding on? Anger, resentment, self-pity, What are you feasting on? And just remember that Satan is a pervert. He's a parasite. He will distort and corrupt and ruin anything good. He gets us to laugh at evil. And he starts with misplaced, forbidding tastings of dainties of doubt and evil. But you don't have to go there. You don't have to. You can come to Jesus. Literally, lift your face. I do this. I lift my face when I am desperate. And Jesus will meet you. He will. Come to the waters. Anyone who thirsts, come by and, and drink wine, milk, without money, without price. Why spend your money on what isn't bread and your labor for what doesn't satisfy Come to me. This is how Jesus sees you. He doesn't see your perfectly kept reputations and your money and your nice house. He knows if you're suffocating. And he loves you. And that's why he came. That's why he died. I saw myself one day in the mirror in my dining room when I was screaming at my kids. I looked exactly like that. And you can ask my kids or my husband. I looked exactly like that. And there, I refuse to believe that's all there is. And because <laughs> this is the promise. I love this passage. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness through knowledge of him, through tasting of him so that we may participate 
in the divine nature and we may escape the corruption. I'm going for that one. I am going for that promise. I don't know what you're struggling with, but Jesus looks at this and he says, no, ma'am, no, sir. Uh, he says, I don't go with that golem junk at all. He has come to set us free. He looks and he sees right through. He knows your hunger is for him. And he is sending himself to our condition. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He became sin and he tasted death. The deepest kind of knowing. God became a golem. He took on our flesh, our clay. He went through every temptation, everything we've ever endured, and he took our death into himself to restore us. And he has invited us to taste of him to metabolize his life and his breath into our own lives, to assimilate his very life into our beings. And we can turn our faces to him and we can breathe in his breath. He's the creator and he can recreate. And he can recreate out of nothing. He's really good at that. And he is here tonight. And we can be recreated in his image. And I'll tell you this. When he recreates you, your life is going to become savory and wonderful and alluring and beautiful. And you're going to turn around and there are going to be people following after you because you are filled with the beauty of Jesus. You're actually going to smell like chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Seriously, you wait. And it's not you, it's him. Are you malnourished? Are you suffocating? If you are, he he has come, he is here to fill you with himself and to satisfy your life. And that's holiness. And we can surrender. Jesus, I'm desperate for you. I got nothing. That's all he asks. And we can exchange our life. He will give us his life in exchange for our mess. And we can escape the corruption. That's what he is offering us. We can be God-breathed. We can be God-bearers. And satisfied. Let's stand together. Jesus, thank you for coming to us. Thank you for taking who we are into yourself. You took our nature into yourself so that we could take your nature into us. And we are wrecked. We cannot do our life. We are desperate for you. We long for you. We, all our desires, everything we crave has its source in you. And I ask Jesus that you would come, oh Holy Spirit, invite and speak with your beautiful voice into the lives of every person here tonight. 
And my precious friends, we're going to pray a song together. And if you want to come here and pray and just offer your being to God, your hungry, suffocating, malnourished self, you can just come to Jesus now here and bow yourself before him. Offer yourself to him. You may not even know what to say. You don't have to know. You can just throw your being and your heart before him. But I invite you to sing this prayer. And if you want to come here and pray, you are so welcome. He is here. And he is offering himself to fill you and restore you, ignite you, re-life you, recreate you with himself. So let's sing together a prayer of offering and surrender.